Go. Ja, tere. Taas esmaspäeva eetris on elusama elukeskkonna poole osa number 26, kui nüüd mälu ei peta. Ja oleme taas eetris siit Tartu rohelise liikumise kontorist ja Henri on kusagil mõjal. Ja maakodust metsa vahelt. Ja ning täna on taaskord eriline episood, sest esiteks me ei ole siin jälle kahekesi, vaid meid on lause neli. Ja kuna tegemist on meie praktikantidega Saksamaalt, siis teiseks eriseks on see, et me oleme täna eetris inglise keeles kohe pärast minu monoloogi. Ja kolmandaks me ei vaata nii palju päeva uudiseid, kui me räägime lihtsalt sellest, et mis asi on keskkonna eetika, mida meie praktikantid Saksamaal õpivad. Nii et ma nüüd vahetan keelt. And hello to Laura and Tapia. Hello. Hello. So, you came to Estonia to be an intern in the Estonian Green Movement. Why? <laughs> um, yeah, we are here for an internship until December. And we came here, basically, the truth is because our faculty from our university only had uh, the cooperation, only had one cooperation oh. with the Estonian government. But, um, so we didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> but we are really glad to be here because, yeah, it's really interesting. And people the, are nice. People are nice, the country <laughs> is nice. I've also traveled a little bit around Estonia. And yeah, I think it's, I'm really glad now that uh, my university sent me here. So what about you? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm also very happy to be here. The topics are very broad in the Estonian uh, Green Movement. We get included a much. That's also nice. <laughs> yeah. um, and me personally, I have a um, personal connection to Estonia anyway, because my grandmother was born here. So I'm glad that our university put up the um, cooperation with an Estonian NGO. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and, and when we got the application, we were looking at the, at the backgrounds and we saw that it's very interesting that you are studying in a master's program that is called environmental ethics. Yes. And this is something, if I'm not mistaken, you cannot learn in Estonia. <laughs> so we were very intrigued to, to hear more about what it, what it actually is. And, and how does it broaden your view? And, and what, what will you become after you have finished this? <laughs> <laughs> so many questions. Uh, first of all, it's um, quite a new um, master's uh, in Germany as well. Yeah. It's, I think, nine years old now. Mm -hmm. So quite a newbie. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, also the only option to get a master's degree in environmental ethics at the University of Augsburg in Germany. So it's the only university in Germany as well who is offering this, offering this uh, program. Yeah. And it's very broad. <laughs> we um, can choose very freely um, our courses and lectures and um, they all have in some sort an environmental topic, but it can be from geography view or like law lectures on international law or I don't know history and politics so it's very broad and we are prepared basically afterwards to do um, anything yeah. and <laughs> nothing at all <laughs> so sort of, no, it's, um, uh, it's really interdisciplinary so our lectures are um, not at not located only in one faculty but uh, like every faculty basically um, has some lectures where we are also allowed to go to even if you're not from the faculty of geography we go there for one lecture which has something to do about fracking or something <laughs> like that because obviously it's uh, really important to know about that if you want to um, Look up, look up on these topics also from an from an ethical view. You have to also knew the, uh, know the know the hard facts. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so we had lectures, as you said, in environmental law, which was from the Faculty of Law, <laughs> obviously, we had some from the Faculty of Geography, we had some from the Faculty of Philosophy and Political Sociology. Science. Yeah. And yeah, so it's very, very broad and you can pick the lectures that you want to specify on. So for me, that's um, yeah, politics. basically politics because I my bachelor's degree is in politics. So I want to specify on environmental politics and that's why I pick that uh, these courses. But yeah, there are also some people who had uh, who have a bachelor's degree in biology or geography. Mm -hmm. And so they pick these courses that they think fits them best. Yeah. And then what makes the, what brings in this ethical side? So you have some, you have many lectures from other faculties, but what's the special thing that only you get extra? There is one lecture. Um, Which that is, is mandatory. Yes, that's the only mandatory lecture. And it's about, it's called environmental ethics and you get the different approaches um, to nature and how you can, <laughs> judge <laughs> sort yeah. of and um, as our masters is very new some teachers might have were the first students to go there mm -hmm. from this masters and we're always the ones who ask the um, like not so nice questions and question everything they teach because they're the hard fact givers <laughs> and we're the ethical like is it okay if you do that and how do you justify it and what are the consequences the implications and um yeah. that's sort of our job at the university mm -hmm. and afterwards i hope as well <laughs> yeah we also we often bring new perspectives to lectures um and also it's not not everything you can choose like uh, you want so there there are different modules that you have to do mandatorily, but you can choose which courses you want to do in the module. But there's also one module about only ethics and philosophy. So you have to choose an ethical lecture, but you can choose which ethical lecture. So that's the way I meant that. So yeah, so everyone, even if they have a bachelor's degree in bachelor's, they have to deal with uh, some ethical kind of uh, stuff in our master's degree yeah yeah that's i think that is something that in estonia we're currently very much into this hard facts uh, state of mind so when somebody asks these ethical questions they're very much dismissed like oh this is nonsense no mm. when we're looking at the forest we're looking at how much trees grow each year and that's the only number that matters mm. and if it grows that much we will cut down that much and this is like hard logic but uh, i know henry was already preparing for this uh, this talk with his uh, own assignments for you so to test your <laughs> your judgment <laughs> Okay. Okay, go. I, I suppose to yeah to, to test to to maybe gain some insight into the thought process. Um, uh, well, coming by coming to the events that have ha occurred occurred in the world and how to go to, about it. Um, um, I remember recently watching a like a, a action movie based on true story on on a court case uh, in USA, where uh, like a chemical factory. Uh, knowingly poisoned the uh, uh, people of the villages that the, their factory was in. They released some toxic chemical into the groundwater, which uh, infected uh, the, the groundwater system, and and people came became ill, and livestock came became ill, and there was a really big uh, fuss about it. And there was like a court case for fourteen years, after which eventually the company settled, settled for some uh, fines in some millions. Nobody was put to jail, some money was paid, but there was a lot of damage done to the environment. And, and uh, to bring another example, in the closer to Estonia, recently we, we saw Estwatch pick up uh, a story from Lithuania where the company producing toilet paper, a cheap toilet paper, in that case, Krita was the brand, 
uh, they were knowingly dumping uh, uh, polluted water into the Baltic uh, Sea. And again, some fines were made uh, and um, and, uh, and the stock of the company went a little bit down, but it, they still continue to operate. And, and there's not really a, a strong solution, like how can we uh, stop such, such uh, behavior uh, from happening again? So I was wondering um, if, uh, if we see that, you know, such behavior at times is like systemic, uh, it, it happens in many places. Uh, uh, how, how can we stop that? even though we have laws that... Uh... Is your question that is such an action ethical or, or does it make it ethical if you pay some fine but then still continue doing the thing that is bad? Answers would be no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but are there some different? But because, but the, but the companies are still doing it. So are there some other flavors of ethics that says that, well, it's kind of okay. Um, basically, no. <laughs> so that was a really easy question. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say something about the case in the USA. I don't know which uh, exact case you were talking about, Henry, yeah, but I, I know that in the USA, um, there are basically these, this uh, green movement started to grow in the 70s and 80s. And one um, cause was that um, there were uh, deposits for trash and they, uh, the local governments and municipalities uh, preferred to put these in areas where poor people and people of uh, color were living. So, environmental issues or not only have like this uh, environmental damaging dimension but also this social dimension and uh, which is about racism and um, so I, I don't think that it's that easy to answer those questions when we don't have all the information the because picture. every problem every uh, environmental problem has different dimensions. So we have to deal with the social dimension. We have to deal with the uh, environmental dimension, which is also not always that easy because for some species uh, that might be positive and for some reasons or species or uh, yeah, but, uh, this, mm -hmm. um, action might be negative so it's it's not that easy when we don't have all the information but if you put it like that and say okay there's one company um <laughs> polluting the sea and uh pays an amount of money only one time or something like that and then continue. continues to pol pollute the sea it's like it's yeah. more symbolic action of the state I guess. yeah but it's not ethical in a social or environmental way. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I have a trickier question then, because as you arrived in Estonia, you mentioned that when you were uh, traveling from Tallinn to Tartu, you noticed that there's not many windmills or, or renewable energy yes. parks uh, to be seen, and uh, which is something you see in Germany a lot. Uh, and the, my question is something I've been battling with is that as we in the environmental movement say that well, obviously we need to go to renewable energy for the future, this also means that this renewable energy has to be built out of something, which means that we will need to get that goal, we need more mines for raw, mm. rare earth metals and so on. So where's the how do you balance this? So, yes, you can't use fossil fuels anymore, but the renewable energy also has its downsides. So, help me. <laughs> so, again, this has different dimensions. So, first of all, we have to ask ourselves, is it possible, is it even possible, possible to 
feed our hunger for energy the way we we have it now in a sustainable way and basically the answer from many scientists is no so the first thing is to cut down energy demand and then the second thing is okay prevent we, rebound effects <laughs> prevent rebound effects and also like this long-term dimension and short uh visions so in a short term thing we, we might think okay um we have to build solar panels and wind parks now doesn't matter which uh resources from uh because we have to uh, the we have to um have enough energy for our demand but the thing is that we also have to think about as you said about side effects of the building of these solar panels so there's also this dimension of recycling um these resources like um, metals and um, lithium and stuff like that because there's also another social dimension because <laughs> you can we get those lithium yeah. from peru and uh, other countries in south america and there this is a huge problem um so yes i think we have to build those wind parks and solar panels but we have to consider every step we undertake to get there so every step has to be thought of in a not only an economical way, but also this ethical way. I think there are ethical ways to build solar panels and windmills, but yeah. Which practically means that while you think of the building and maintenance, you should always um, include thinking of the industry that's doing the recycling, the yes. upcycling. You, yes. you have to implement a whole industry around it and also a lot of like science and going into it and thinking and making also batteries more effective and there has to be a unity in the scientific community to like pull on that one string to um, get every technology um, be environmentalist and social friendliest possible way because using fuels <laughs> fossil fuels um, will damage as well so as you said it's difficult to balance but it's the challenge that uh, we should undertake <laughs> have you seen this kind of discussion in in germany like the first point you said it's to cut down on energy use i've tried it in estonia it doesn't work very well for people <laughs> they don't want to listen to this so is is germany more advanced in that sense so is there a discussion on this? Um, I think there are articles, activists um, trying to get this thinking into the population, but it is difficult because it means, um, it, I think people expect it's going to be less quality life than if they have to, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> not, wa not waste so much. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and they, they feel like maybe their personal freedom or something is cut and don't see the, the further dimension which we are <laughs> hoping to uh, bring to them for a better, deeper understanding and therefore a change in behavior and even maybe recognizing that um, wasting less energy doesn't mean that you uh, like <laughs> have less quality life, but maybe you feel better even so try to make that twist and change thinking yeah but um in germany there's not everything going that well <laughs> too so um there's for example there's a huge movement against windmills huge movement and um in some points they are right you know like this bird thing yeah windmills can kill birds it's it's as simple as that they they are right there but so um but there are some points where i think german companies are yeah going in a, in the right direction 
when they want to include people in this uh, windmill company thing and generating money they they are at the moment uh, there are some projects where the local population like from a village uh, is included in the money this windmill park will generate and stuff and also there are now windmills with sensors who stop when there are birds coming and um, yeah, so there, there are different things you can do to prevent people from being against windmills and renewable energies, but you also have to think about points that they might be maybe right. In. But yeah, there are also people who think that windmills may be um, unhealthy or something like that. So. I don't know. I think there, there, there has to be much more going on project-wise, uh, where scientists are really explaining why windmills are not um, unhealthy for the local population and stuff. But there are some projects that are really, really good. And yeah, the movement against windmills is still big. But I think that these projects are a solution so you always have to keep in mind to um yeah work with the local population and not just build a windmill because it's obviously the best for our climate yeah, yeah. but you also have to include the local population yes yeah, so it's about education and acceptance yeah so you can't become this co2 chauvinist only, only yes. seeing this one yes. number and, and yes. disregarding everything else I uh, ask about more about the uh, chauvinism, well, local community. I've heard that in uh, Germany, Belgium, and and the, think the Netherlands was it. Uh, it's quite popular to have these energy cooperatives that uh, are locally based and are owned by the communities themselves, uh, uh, and and they're getting fairly popular. And even that the communities are. Uh, taking uh, up bigger projects uh, like for example going to um, uh, a grant uh, choosing in Scotland to like uh, expand their uh, renewable energy uh, production capabilities um, I, I wonder if uh, if uh, the energy cooperatives are uh, owned by the people lo the local people, and I guess more people than than just some uh, a corporation. Uh, do they uh, are they like more concerned about the environmental aspects? Then are they more like uh, ethical in their their judgment? Uh, do they like seek more to co more consensus? Um, Did you say in your example that uh, the people in one country are actually now so successful in their community that they are also expanding internationally yeah yeah exactly that they're internationally going to another country and 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 expanding their um, renewable energy parks there <laughs> well i haven't heard of that but it's true that in germany there are um initiatives um from villages that um, then buy their own windmill or maybe two or three um and this um is growing and it comes from, I think there's again several uh, dimensions. Uh, one thing, um, they prefer to own it instead of having them at their doorway anyway, but the big company makes the money. I think that's um, some sort of taking possession of the changes um, that are upfront. And with that comes a greater awareness of the energy question in times of climate change. And um, yes, and it can also be empowering and um, yeah, bring new life into the village community. Um, yeah. I've also yes. uh, watched some documentations about projects like these. And um, I think that these people seem to be very proud about the project and the, that they profit from these windmills 
So I think that um, profiting from those windmill parts could possibly um, increase um, acceptance. acceptance and uh, empowerment um, for green issues overall. But I don't know any scientific research studies about uh, this phenomenon. So yeah, it's only my impression by watching these documentaries. So I've, I've read about these uh, people living off grid. So they have their own, let's say solar panels or or windmills, but they're not connected to the larger electrical grid. So all the power they have is from their own production. Yeah, but that's rather and difficult what, in Germany because yeah. in many, many villages force you to like uh, use the local energy supply. They can't force you. Yeah, can yeah. They? actually, if you get solar panels and they were substituted from the state, and then, oh, then you probably, have yeah. to like put it into the uh, public net. But, but there are self-sufficient houses. Yeah, but, like but for, for those lucky ones who can have their own panels <laughs> yeah. and, and consume it too, what has happened in, in these studies is that people really become aware of their energy consumption. So they know and they slightly change their own behavior in order to still have a nice, very comfortable life. But they just know that if tomorrow there is no sun, I will wash my clothes today. Yeah. Not tomorrow, because tomorrow there is less energy available. Yeah. Um, I think in Augsburg, there are some people planning on a tiny house village, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know if that uh, will be become energy a, sufficient. Yeah, it will be energy sufficient. And I, I don't even know if they are um, allowed to build it, but I heard of some people dreaming about a tiny house village near Augsburg. So maybe we can send you some photos when that project will become real life in a few year, uh, years, I don't know. And it's um, maybe the same with energy consumption. If you like have to provide it for yourself, you get another feeling and understanding of mm -hmm. it. And it's the same, like if you, <laughs> it comes out of the wall, right? It's just <laughs> provided and- um, There's no yeah. connection. Yeah. yeah, there's no connection and um, I'm, I'm daring to to bring the example it's the same with meat mm -hmm. we don't see the animal we just get like the product which is utterly prepared for us to use mm -hmm. and there's the connection and therefore the understanding missing for our consumption so i can understand that yeah, people you don't were, see the whole, yeah. whole yeah. um life cycle yeah right thing. but to, to answer henry's question i think mm -hmm. this is very interesting if if like a small local cooperative is now building <laughs> parks in another country. So that would mean that the profit would still go to them, the original builders, not the other community that they are building in, which is very weird. So it sounds like the this like capitalist model reproducing itself. So that's that's usually what I also comment when I see all these energy democracy. Uh, I don't know, booklets or, or posters, they also say that, yes, we need to grow this very big, very fast. And then I always ask, well, how big? <laughs> can, can we like, set the limit, not go crazy again, but with just simple, different technology? I, I don't know a village in Germany that has gone crazy about their <laughs> windmill profits. So. <laughs> um, the capitalist uh, issue you mentioned, I wanted to get back on that anyway. Um, as the first question Henry had um, about the companies um, like polluting environment, mm -hmm. uh, causing health damage and stuff, and then just having to pay some fine. That's also part of the problem of <laughs> the capitalist uh, system, mm -hmm. I think. And that was a point we were missing back then. So I just wanted to add that. Um, there's also some change needed. <laughs> so in your studies, do you also get like this economy? Yes. Economy background. Yes. yes. We have at least, I think, three lectures about that. Yeah. That's the minimum. So, mm -hmm. of course, it's uh, not that radical as many of the students are. It's more <laughs> moderate because it's still at university. 
but um, and at, at the economic uh, faculty. Yes, yeah, so, so it's quite <laughs> difficult. But again, we're like the weird ones asking the unliked questions. Yeah, but um, still, there's some discussion about it um, in our yeah. masters, at least um, within the students, and we try to get yeah. this discussion into a. <laughs> yeah, but we we did we haven't had uh, lectures about anti-capitalist uh, systems or <laughs> ecological yes. economics. Or... Yes, yeah. that would be nice for yeah. But um, it. as we said, uh, this master's program is only nine years old, so it's still establishing. Yeah, so yeah. there's much to come in the future. I hope. <laughs> Henry, you had a question? Um, uh, not really. Like, uh, I get a really good answer for the last one. Uh, like the social <laughs> and the fi financial uh, sides, uh, you get the uh, benefit the uh, co community, like empower the community. Um, yeah. Uh, well, we can, we can go, go definitely to the to the economics uh, side of environmental pr uh, protection. Um, uh, 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 where, where do we start? Well, what? well, uh, I suppose uh, when when we talk about climate change, it's, it's been like for fifty years or like forty years, uh, like consensus that there is man-made climate change and it's gonna get, become fairly catastrophic if we don't take serious direct action towards it um, uh, uh, and yet like if, uh, today we see 1.2 degrees of global warming and and uh, things about to go get fairly bad they are, are quite bad in uh, some regions um, I suppose uh, what do you think uh, how it's connected to the economics uh, of how not how the failure of dealing with the climate crisis is connected to the economics sphere of human life but but that would make it a bit more easier to you or, or difficult i don't know can you connect it somehow to your experience in estonia that you've had for like a month or or two so what's what's your like first feelings of are we doing well here or doing enough <laughs> or not in terms of climate change or, or fighting the system? Well, first, the general thing is like it's uh, about capitalism and how it influences climate change. We're on a planet with uh, natural boundaries and we're trying to do infinite growth that's not working. Simple logic doesn't work. And um, still, the system is somehow so powerful and uh, flexible to adapt that it's um, seducive, <laughs> stick to it, and hard to fight it because you might just get uh, swallowed up anyway. Um, so I think there's always more to be done, but I'm not daring to uh, give an answer to your Estonian question because I'm uh, not as informed as I'd like to be when I answer it. <laughs> um, but you've got feeling, you get out of the plane and you see that no windmills, no uh, no solar park very much, but anything else, some, something positive. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of forests. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you have to, like, um, as little as I know for now, um, see the points from where the environmental movement starts in a country. And if we're looking at Germany, we have like a long history of engagement for a change. Um, for the better and um, Estonia had some well let's say <laughs> troubled history so they uh, didn't have this long time to prepare change um, but I think you're trying your best <laughs> and that's what counts. Yeah, you're saying that your your uh, master's program is new we're saying our country is new. <laughs> yeah that's right. so it, it just takes time time we might not have but um, yeah. Who are we to judge? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I think the thing is that we're from Germany, and Germany is doing so many bad stuff as well. So really, who are we to judge? Um, 
I think that there are things that Germany does better and there are things that Estonia does better. But uh, overall, none of these countries does enough <laughs> to right. fight climate change. Right. So we can agree on One that. One is less <laughs> bad than the other, but neither <laughs> is good. The, yeah. thing, the thing is to Estonia is doing better or has done better until now is protecting its forests because in Germany forests are really meant to be used, meant to be used in a capitalist way. We have, uh, we humans have to profit from these forests. And for now, Estonia has done really much better in, in, in that topic. But as we all know, there are <laughs> Bad things going on in Estonian forests. Even you know. <laughs> Even we know. So, yeah, I think that is one really, really important thing Estonia has to protect is its forests with its large ecosystems where bears are living, lynx are living, lynxes are living, um, and wolves are living. So, all these animals are have gone extinct in Germany. They're slightly coming back though. Slightly. Have some have wolves, wolves yeah. uh, but, but still. But and still, yeah. um, not the it's same. Not, not just about the forest animals, but also about you can replant trees, but you can't replant a forest because yeah. it has grown for decades. Yeah, you can re so, remake this, uh, rebuild this ecosystem. Yeah which is also really important to fight climate change because uh, they store carbon dioxide. Yeah, so quite a lot. <laughs> basically that's a huge issue which uh, should be protected in Estonia. In Germany, there was a huge, huge discussion in the 80s about one national park. Uh, all the guys were freaking out about the idea to just leave the forests uh, as, it as it is and also leave the forests and uh, let itself overcome diseases um, so it was a huge discussion then they uh, let it be itself and didn't interfere uh, and the forest turned out great but uh, that's like only the, the the only example i think we have in germany there are there are a few national parks but it's not like that it's such a grown ecosystem as in estonia so you really have to protect that yeah. Yeah, well it's really unique. In, in statistics estonia does have a lot of forests but like this actual old growth un untouched forests are about one or two percent of these and the, of course the logging companies are really eager to yeah. to get these mm. as well so but it's more than in germany for sure. I don't know the don't statistics, know, but I, I would bet on that that <laughs> Germany, there's less than 1% untouched forests. Um, at the last uh, Fridays for Future strike, a man came up and asked us, as we were Germans, if we knew uh, Peter Wohlleben, which is an author who wrote the book about the secret life of trees. Mm. It's quite well known. It's translated into many languages. and this idea is getting more popular in Germany as well. And um, yeah, just leave forests to themselves so they can turn out best and uh, restore themselves. And yeah. <laughs> so I think it's a book about how trees are much more complex than yes, what you would Yes, they're connected, communicate in some yeah, ways. Forests are communicating with each yeah. other. And Crazy. It's, so, to, so that's what, what we mean when we say listen to the science, yes. which is to not only listen to the, like the forestry science that says how much you can cut at what, what mm -hmm. time, but actually look at the wider, wider uh, field of what's happening. And I, well, that's, that's another different one hour story I, that we can't <laughs> go into today because our time is running, running out. And if Henry doesn't have any final burning questions, Oh no, no, really, really good to listen uh, to the ideas. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Of course, would want to rant a lot on on the uh, forest topic, but I'm also really glad that we 
still have some natural forest in Estonia that can stand for and, and uh, give an example of what a forest uh, stands for. Yeah, so with this, I think uh, we're coming to close. Thank you very much, Laura and Tabea, for taking time in your very busy schedule here. We're putting you to work every day as much as we can. And uh, we will continue with our daily business here. And thanks for people listening or listening after afterwards. And I put the links or the, the mentionings of the film. Uh, the film was Dark Waters, right, Henry? Yep, yep, exactly that one. Yeah, so the book, what, book was The Secret Life of Trees. Both are highly recommended. Check it out and you will never be the same again. <laughs> <laughs> and with this, we close. Take care. Yeah, was Bye. a pleasure. Bye, have a good day. Thanks. Bye.